moment when she handed it over to me, palms up, and it was the team. And I was on my way to Paris. This was in June 2012, and in July 2012, I took the team one with me. And at every opportunity, uh, on the long plane ride, in the airport, in the hotel, everywhere, I was reading this book, and I felt like it was actually speaking to me personally. And when I got back about a week later, I reached out and to Francis, well, actually it was an email that was in the back of the book, I believe, which said, if you wanted more books, uh, this is where you had to, to, this is who you had to contact. And Francis contacted me back to confirm my order. And I was so, Francis, I don't know if you know this, I was like, oh my God, I'm talking to Francis Key. Wow, she actually <laughs> called me. <laughs> Because sometimes we've said and done things that we so terribly regret, and then you realize it was like a tidal wave. It was more than you, and you were really tapped into. And this is true for everything, whether it, if you're struggling with addiction, it's not just your addiction. You are tuned into the addiction of others because you're tuned into the vibrational sphere of addiction. And if you're tuned into bliss, when you go into a state of bliss and, and say you're meditating, which many of us do in meditation, we are connecting with the bliss of all the universe, of all who have ever deposited meditational bliss. So you got to accentuate the positive. Wow, I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. Always a blessing to be with you all. Well, today I've got one of my favourites back on the show, the beautiful Frances Reiki. Welcome to the show, Frances. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to tell you all about Frances for people that haven't met Frances before. I think we've done about at least half a dozen shows either on the ATP and in the Inner Sanctum, haven't we? There's quite a few that we've done together over the years. Yes, yes. For people that don't know, I'll read your bio. And please remember if you're liking the shows and you're getting a lot of the shows to subscribe and like and leave a comment or send me an email, tell me what you think. It really helps the algorithms on all the platforms. I'm now on Odyssey and Rumble, as well as BitChute and all the audio platforms, which many of them you can't leave a comment, but some of them that you can. Well, let me tell you, we've got a special show today. We've got lots of things happening. Let me tell you a little bit about Francis. Uh, for those people that haven't met Francis before, I believe that Francis's books, I always tell people who are on a spiritual journey, are mandatory reading. So on October 9th in 2010, at the age of 86, Gloria Crystal Teddy Key passed away at her Florida home with her family by her side. 19 days later, her lilting Australian voice, because she was born in Australia, began to communicate with her eldest daughter, Frances, about the scope and the wonders of her perspective from the afterlife state. This communication resulted in four amazing spiritual books called the Team Books, the Team Series, A Mother's Wisdom from the Other Side. This remarkable collection of insights written in less than a year and divided into the four books has astounded friends, families, and a growing circle of readers with its unique analogies and depth of wisdom and unusual outlook on the human experience. Teddy conveys that each soul is on earth as a member of a spiritual team with overarching and specific missions in this life. She reveals how various teams work through what appears to be individuals and how there's so much more than meets the eye to our relationships, our environment and impulses. Frances was an English teacher to immigrants and refugees for 18 years. She worked in a refugee camp at one time and also was a music teacher, songwriter and playwright, having put on a play a few years ago, which was very successful, as well as the channel and the medium and scribe for the form team books. And now two more wonderful books, a novel called the Train to Hofhausen. Did I get that right, Francis? That's right, Hofhausen. 
and a new book about to come out called Verified. And we're going to talk about the new books today. Also, we're going to talk about the team books, because as I say, I love them. They're my favorite spiritual books and mandatory reading for anyone on a spiritual journey. This is something that it's at the very beginning of the books, which I always try to remember word for word, never do. <laughs> you are not alone. You are not really even functioning as one person. Nobody is. For you are a member of a team, a spiritual team that is as close to you as breathing. And this is what Teddy was saying to you, your mum from the other side, and I am a part of your team. And we've got a special guest. Well, Francis, do you want to talk first quickly about how you've just put the team books into audio version? Yes, yes, because this is what our special guest is all about. Well, as you've said, four books were written and it took a course of about three years to get them all typed up, edited and out there. And for some years, I would receive letters uh, from different readers asking, are you ever going to have these in an audio book? Um, and that is another phase of work, as most people who've ever done a book realize. But one particular person contacted me in 2012. Her name is Lisa Simone. And we simply started exchanging emails about the book, about her questions, uh, about uh, how they were affecting her personally and healing her life on so many levels. And then as time went by, I got to know her better and she, um, I became aware of her many other gifts and of her incredible legacy. Uh, she is the, the one and only child of Nina Simone, the jazz legend that we all know about. Uh, she is an incredible talent and leader in her own right, a Broadway star and uh, writes the most beautiful spiritual music of her own, as well as does the most amazing tributes to her own mother. Uh, so Lisa kept encouraging me through the years to make the audiobooks. Uh, she said it, it simply needs to be done. So at her encouragement, I began there are four narrators, and Lisa graciously agreed to do some of the chapters. You will hear her voice on the book, uh, as well as an Australian actor who I became friends with in New York City, had to have an Aussie in there to represent mom and myself and my sister, uh, who does a beautiful job. So the four voices of, of We Women are on the first book in audio. We have three more to go, but we have one done. Uh, and it's so exciting. Um, so uh, I'd love you to bring on our Lisa and she can talk a little bit about herself and her connection to the books. Hello, Lisa. Welcome to the <laughs> show. So beautiful yeah. to have you on the show. And I'm excited to hear about how the books affected you. I know how they affected me and I'm really looking forward to knowing how the books affected you. Uh, in 2012, to follow up on what Francis said, a friend of mine who was actually a, a person who does quantum balancing, she um, handed me this book and said, someone gave this to me, but I don't think it's for me. I think it's for you. And oh I remember that moment when she handed it over to me, palms up, and it was the team. And I was on my way to Paris. This was in June, 2012. And in July, 2012, I took the team one with me. And at every opportunity uh, on the long plane ride in the airport and hotel, everywhere, I was reading this book and I felt like it was actually speaking to me personally. And when I got back about a week later, I reached out and to Francis, well, actually it was an email that was in the back of the book, I believe, which said, if you wanted more books, uh, this is where you had to, to, this is who you had to contact. And Francis contacted me back to confirm my order. And I was so, Francis, I don't know if you know this. I was like, oh my God, I'm talking to Francis Key. Wow, she actually <laughs> called me. <laughs> and from that- ordinary point, person here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I know what you mean. And yeah. so we, we just clicked. And um, from that point forward, you know, we've managed to stay in contact for the last 10 years. I don't even remember telling you that, that 
audiobooks were like the next thing that had to be done. I was so excited. I know I talked about also translating these books into different into languages. Other languages, how, yeah. How can we get this out into the world? Because there are so many people who are suffering, so many people who need to, to know and that they are not alone. And I wrote a song called Remember to Remember on my last album, In Need of Love, and lyrics say, you are not alone. Remember mm -hmm. the challenges yes. that you've overcome and the lessons yeah. you've learned along the way. You're not alone. Just look back at how far you've come. You're right on time. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm very honored to be here with you, Francis, and to be a participant in the audio portion of book one. And um, it's a treasure of mine that I'm never without. It goes with me everywhere. And since the audiobook has come out, I don't know how, at least every day I send out about five announcements. I'm going through my my contacts A to Z. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it, it. People, you know, uh, I'm I'm not a listener of audiobooks. I know some people really that's all they ever do, but I have had so many people tell me, "Oh my gosh, it is so different to listen to the material than to read it." And it is because even as I edited, you know, I became aware of that the power of the human voice, first of all, the, the emotion of the voice, the pure vibration, the energy, you know, I believe that our team, our teammates, spiritual teammates can come through sound much easier than concrete matter. So whether it's our voice or whether it's music, um, they can imbue it with a different energy. And I hear it, I hear it in the recordings. So I'm very excited for other people to, to have access to it and to experience it in a, a new way, even if they've been reading the books for a while. Mm. It lives. Well, I'm it so lives. pleased that it's getting yeah, more, it's getting out there more because, you know, I don't know how yeah. long have we known each other, Francis, a few years now. It's, it, you, you said 10 years ago that you found the books, Lisa. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I've obviously put Francis on the show a lot to, to spread the message, but I reached just a, you know, a few thousand, like not the whole world. And I was like, the, but the whole world needs to know about this. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, the whole world needs to know. Yeah. So I'm so pleased that it's getting out there more widely because yeah. Yes. Uh, it definitely has enough. grown. I mean, mm -hmm. many more people have, have the books and uh, I get the most beautiful letters, you know, they mean the world when somebody writes a letter and says, you know, what the books are doing for them, or I, I'm able to have a meeting with someone through Zoom or personally, um, you know, lately it's definitely been through Zoom, but um, and just answer questions and help them see how they can apply the principles to their actual lives. It is practical. Yeah, You know, as lofty as the material it is, it is very practical. It's very practical. Yeah, lofty and practical. That's a good way of describing it. Uh -huh. It's a great way. Of, but I'd love to know how it, it, it changed you. And, you know, when your friend gave it to you, Lisa, I'm speaking to Lisa, uh, when um, because Francis and I have discussed many times how it changed you and in, mm -hmm. indeed the process of bringing through the books, how that changed you, which I was always mesmerised at. But that's on other shows that people can look at. But Lisa, I'd love to know where you were at spiritually when they were given to you, because obviously your friend gave them to you. You're already wide open, you know, spiritually. So how did they change you? At the time, I had just uh, applied to meditation school. I graduated in 2015 from the Three Doors Academy uh, with a certificate in therapeutic meditation. So I was just starting that journey as well. And it just touched my heart. The language was so simple and easy to understand, even though, and, and, and also I have to say when my mother died in, on April 21st, 2003, just like when Crystal Teddy Key died, my life changed. My experiences here opened up in a way that I never imagined because my mother started reaching out to me from the other side as well. And I found myself eager to hear her. Um, mm -hmm. Other people, she would channel through other people. So, and I felt like I was just like, mom, you know, here she is. Meanwhile, the other people were kind of freaking out and thought they were 
we thought they were, what's the word, possessed. And I'm like, that's my mother. That's, oh. It's a mm-hmm. gift, you know what I'm saying? So right. I was always mm-hmm. familiar, if you will, with this. And so to, to be reading a book by a woman who was also had been touched in this way by her mother even more deeply and was channeling through her uh, this kind of material was was almost like me being out in the desert and having not had enough water for a long time. I just um, I just needed it. And so since then, I've read books two, three and four. And Francis can tell you many times I'll call her like, what does this mean? Or I've memorized this passage or, you know, there, there's punctuation off. Over here. <laughs> you help me catch some errors. <laughs> I'm still doing that. It's been like study material for me. And it's helped to confirm a lot of things on my spiritual journey. Uh, And it's touched my music. It's touched my everyday life. It's touched my spiritual practice. And it's also helped to elevate my relationship to my own personal human journey here on this realm. Mm -hmm. And with our world going through so much of what it's going through and so many people that suffer that might not even be aware that that's what they're experiencing because they don't know anything else. For them to have an opportunity to read a book like this that is simple enough in its language because wording is so very, very important and, and they hold vibration. And to be able to hear readers, you know, not everybody can do an audio book and make you feel like they draw you in. Mm-hmm. And then every now and then you get someone who when they read a book, you feel like they've lived it and you're, just, you're drawn in to the material. That's what I feel like with this particular book. And I think it's just going to help so many people as it has myself. and and so many others who who know about these books already yeah i love i love the whole concept of the team because you know on this earth experience we experience separation we experience individualization and the truth of who we are is that we are this collective and i call my guides very irreverently the mob you know (laughs) because oh they love it you know they love it (laughs) um initially I called them blissful beings but um the mob because there is these people are like who are they who are they and I'm like oh you know they're they're not individual they're this collection of 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 experience and thought and ideas and they've been you know when I speak to them they've been individual they've been individuals we've been so many we've been so many when I was asking when I was a young girl who is my spirit guide thinking from an individual perspective that there was some individual that was speaking to me because we're so individualized here, right? And the team books totally explodes that separation concepts and puts us back in the, in the family, in the team. Yeah. Yeah. But when I, when I said, you know, who are you, who are you? They said, we have been so many people, you know, like (laughs) choose who you want to be. Which one would you like us to be? Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Who do you want to speak to? Yeah. But uh, Francis, do you want to share more of your experiences about working with Lisa? Oh, yes. Yes. Let's talk a little bit more about this because not only did Lisa encourage me and inspire me, she uh, urged me to to launch it, and so we did right when COVID was going on. So the end result was she recorded her her chapters in France, and I really want you to tell where you, you describe where you uh, recorded your chapters. I think it's beautiful, and I did mine in New York and in Florida. My sister did hers here in Florida, and. Uh, Our Australian lady did hers in New York City in three different apartments in three different closets. So we had this incredible challenge. We did it all the wrong way because really the the best way to do anything like that, as anybody knows, but COVID didn't allow it, was to all meet at one studio and be processed quickly and efficiently with an engineer. So it took us a while to get all the pieces put together and it actually is quite lovely, the end result. But uh, Lisa, why don't you describe your um, your booth, your sound booth? <laughs> I think hectic. people will love it. <laughs> it was definitely a bit hectic. Um, I was in the middle of preparing to to move, and I was in the middle of of concerts and traveling. And so Frances had explained to me what she had set up in her house, and so I was inspired to do that. So I wound up in a closet. 
um, <laughs> surrounded by clothing and pillows and blankets to to block out any extra sounds of the neighbor's but, music or dogs barking or anything like that yeah. I had a certain time of day. And it was interesting because, you know, I, I've recorded in, I've been recording for 20 years. So I know what it is to go into a certain type of studio and work a certain kind of way. And for me to have my own personal setup that I had devoted and set up with my own hands and heart for this audio recording was quite special mm -hmm. and quite an interesting experience um, to actually do it and to really be reading these chapters aloud, you know, reading them in your mind is one thing, but to actually bring them to life with your own voice by yourself in a closet and, and have these words start to resound and live in that way was a very interesting experience. So uh, it was hectic, but I'm really happy that we came out with the result that, that we did in the midst of all that was going on. <laughs> Yeah, it was funny and it was wonderful and it was frustrating, and uh, but it was worth it. The next book will be done in a much more efficient way. <laughs> so, the audio, so the audio book is just book one at this point? Yes. 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 Is, do you have a favourite chapter or favourite part of the books? I know I do. I, I often refer to it, but Lisa, I'm talking to Lisa, or, or both of you, Francis. Oh, oh, oh. Well, uh, I, I could not even begin. Um, Lisa did three chapters and she did the hodgepodge that is the earth mm -hmm. and the i just love what you how you come across in that particular one and then you parallel vibrations i remember you did parallel vibrations and um, i'm going to use my aging brain as an excuse for not remembering the third one you did because <laughs> there's so many of them I, uh, I I'm not sure what the other one was I don't remember I've moved between countries I've I I've know I know I know you have. but I do remember the experience I do remember the joy and feeling so honored to be able to do it to, uh -huh. to invest my heart and my time into helping to bring this book to life in the way that I always imagined. Mm -hmm. And that was what, you know, really resounded with me uh, the most. I, I wished I could have done more, but you know what? Sometimes you just do the best you can with what you got. Yeah. And you, get moving. And you know, what yeah. you were able to do, how you were able to put this together, Francis, the dedication, the time, the effort, the commitment, look at what we have in our hands now. It's, it's right. fantastic. Yeah, it's all worth it. It's all wonderful. And it became available through Audible. I kept waiting because they have to, to approve everything. I kept waiting. It became available just in time to release uh, and send out the email to everyone on the day my mother passed. Oh, wow. On October 9th. And it really, it really felt like there was a certain energy that had to line up. And it yeah. was that was the time that it was yeah. to occur. Team. It was the team. It was the team. The, the team. The twelfth. The twelfth year. The twelfth year. She died twelve years ago. Twelve years so ago. The wow. first book, the book that we just did, was written in three weeks. She died in October. It was written in three weeks, and it was put out in in January. The other books, it took a while to finish them, but it took longer to type them up because everything was handwritten. So, yeah, yeah. But you it know, was can a I automatic read? writing kind of process. Yes. You asked me what my favorite chapter was mm -hmm. or the chapters that stand out. Mm -hmm. Every single one. <laughs> Everyone has its own special message um, and its own. It's like each one is a, its own different recipe. And I find that each one, I mean, I'm in the process of reading again now and listening to the audiobook at the same time. And I find that each one has its own particular message that resounds very deeply with me. And um, I love True Joy. That chapter, True Joy, is just, ah, you know? But yeah. they, all, they all make me do that, you know? Yeah. How do you find knowing that you're a member of a team helps you in your daily life, Lisa, like especially with your music? I have a friend who has just transitioned who is the most incredible musician and um, I speak about him a lot on the show 
and he said to me um, at the beginning of the year or this year that he didn't believe in me and my spirit guides and he didn't want me to talk about it to him and he didn't believe in life after death and he was very adamant <laughs> he was very adamant that I wasn't to speak to him about this because we knew he was dying he had a long journey with cancer but you know watching him flow through people like especially at his funeral he was Jewish and he gave his flute to a friend and uh, his friend said that he was playing the flute for him, you know, like flowing through. He's he's still playing music and he's still here. And, yeah, and he's kind of flowing through other people. Do you find that, Lisa, when you're, when you're doing your music? When I'm on stage, I definitely channel. There is, it's much bigger than me. And I'm able yes, to, is. no matter... No matter how I'm feeling when I go on stage, there is an alchemy that takes place. There's a transformation. As, as most of people who are familiar with me as a performer, I've always said that the stage is a sacred place mm -hmm. for me. When I step out onto that stage, it is an experience. It's mm -hmm. not a show. It's a give and take, and it's a sharing of hearts. And uh, my promise when I realized I wanted to do this for a living I said, help me to inspire positivity and love in others from the stage through the example of my own life. And it took about 20 years. I didn't realize that last piece right there. It's like, okay, well, then you have some more living to do. And you have some <laughs> more lessons to learn yeah. um, before you can actually apply that and embody what needs in the way that it needs to be so that you can impart the healing to others that you want to be able to do. And I've reached a point in my life where I'm able to do that and I'm attracting that kind of material to me. I'm able to share it with others. And even just being here on the show with you, accentuate the positive. Which I love. <laughs> you know, I've been wanting my music to get out into the world of spirituality and those of us who believe and know, um, know what it is to walk in this way and that yeah. we are not alone yeah, and that yeah. we can be happy in the midst yeah. of madness yeah. and, mm. and feel strong and at ease knowing that all is indeed well and all is in perfect order. Mm. Um, so to be able to be here with both of you today, uh, promoting this particular book in this way, it's just magnificent. And this is what my music is all about. And so at the yes, end of a concert, is. at the end of a concert, you know, I've had people tell me that they came in with pains in their back or mm -hmm. their legs and they couldn't stand up. And by the end of my concert, they were dancing, you know, and wow. I've had other people tell me that some people contact me online. One young lady in particular said she was about to take her life. And my song, Let It All Go, came mm -hmm. on and she stopped and she rewound it. It was, I guess it was on some kind of a streaming and she rewound it over and over and over again. She was not on social media. She found me, she, she created a social media personality just to find me, mm -hmm. just to talk to me and share with me about what she was going through and how that particular song wow. inspired her to come on back and know that everything was okay. And so that I feel like that's why we're here in our own ways to inspire others. We are not alone. And all is well. Everything is perfectly planned. Everything that we go through in our lives is not random. And, um, you know, who knows what this world's going to be like in another 50 or 60 or whatever many years when, when the collective that is us here yeah. on this yeah. planet, 3D, yeah. really start yeah. to live from that place and to use our collective energy to create in the way that we know is possible. How magnificent is that going to be? Yeah. Yeah, music is such a powerful forum, isn't it? It's so powerful. You know, my friend that transitioned, as I said, he didn't believe in all this stuff. And when he transitioned, he's like been one of the best communicators that I've had who's been a friend <laughs> or a family member that's transitioned. You know, I've got better communicators, but I haven't necessarily known them personally in the physical. And um, and when I he, he had a really bad stutter and so he didn't, and every time I say he didn't communicate well, he corrects me and he says, I communicated perfectly, but I didn't communicate <laughs> the way that you expect people to communicate. I communicated through my music. And he wasn't uh -huh. a singer. He was a musician. Uh -huh. And so he communicated. He said, I communicated masterfully, but I communicated through my, not but, I communicated yeah. through my music. Yeah. And so oh, yeah. 
yeah, music communicates so much wisdom and so it's much. The universal language. Right. It is the universal language. Right. With, all, with most uh, spiritual practices and spiritual teachings, one of the things I find that it all comes down to is creativity. They all mm -hmm. talk about the power of creativity and how that's us expressing God through our creativity. So, yeah, and absolutely. What are the messages that your mother has brought to you from the other side, Lisa? Oh, <laughs> oh my. <clears throat> She's very that's, busy, isn't it's she? It's been a long time since I've been asked that question. Uh, well, how much she loves me, how proud she is of me, and that um, she realizes how much pride she walked in um, and how much fear she was walking in at the time because my mother died of cancer. And um, she was bipolar, manic depressive. Uh, when you see the Netflix documentary, What Happened, Miss Simone, that is the only documentary where she actually leads you in the first person through her life. So, um, you know, I wanted people to get a, a deeper understanding of why her reputation was the way that it was. And a lot of times there's what we see that we present the world and it's, there's what's really going on in the backstory. Yeah. And so many people walk away with it with a much, much more compassion for her, which is what I wanted. And mm -hmm. so she has said to me how um, she realizes that her pride got in the way um, of, a, of a lot, kept her in pain. Uh, for many years. And so, um, and just that she's with me all the time and how proud she is of me because the healing that I've done within myself. What chapter is it, Francis? Okay, you're on the line now. Where you talk about the clay, where you've lot your. Yeah, the clay. Oh, uh, I'm not going to remember the chapter, but okay. yes, I know. She says how, and my teacher talked about this, when we heal ourselves in the present, we're healing the past and the future at the same time. Right. So all the healing work that I've done with my own heart, I've also healed my mom. Right. Yes. And so she commented on that and thanked That's me. That's what it's what all saying. To right. help heal her and her journey yeah. and where she is right now. And because of all the inner work that I've done in the last 12 years, I've also freed her mm -hmm. to go further wherever she is because she doesn't have to worry about me anymore. My my grief, my pain, my longing um, uh, is no longer what it was. So she's now free to let me go knowing that I'm all right. Ah, oh, beautiful. Yeah, Frances and I have talked about this on other shows about how when your, uh, your, your team members can work on your karma so that you don't have to sort of come back and do it all again, so to speak, but that your team at work Truly. members can take on. Can ta and, I, and I think, you know, I see this a lot with especially star seeds, you know, with, with the beings that have um, volunteered to be here on Earth to really clean up the density that Earth has been through. They like taking on all this karma and then they come into the physical from their perspective on the other side or their perspective in a, even in another dimension or on another planet as higher conscious beings, they go, yeah, this will be easy. And then they come into the human form and they're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, every time, every time I do one of these uh, interviews, I always sit down about 30 minutes before and I open the book randomly. I ask the team and I pick up the books and I ask them to show me what, what sections I should read. And it's always correct, of course. It's so it's so cool. So what you're talking about right now with reincarnation uh, and an expanded view of reincarnation and, and who we really are and all these aspects of our being and how, how we take on each other's collective karma, uh, that came up in book three. And I remember when I opened, I thought, gosh, is that going to even be, that seems like, Maybe not to be talked about this time, but here it is. It's one of the passages. I'm going to read it right now. Um, <clears throat> okay. This is your life, your one life, one journey by one being belonging to one team, which is part of one vast collective. Free yourself of the considerations of past, present, and future lifetimes. 
a concept of karma that is completely personalized, a description of your existence as before and after, and the struggle of reaching the pinnacle of anything whatsoever. Understand that you are the reincarnation of your own intentions and those of your team. If one needs to try to keep an individual model of the concept of reincarnation, then let it be so. However, since transition, my mother's speaking here, since she passed, I have come to see there's a much wider implication to this system. Uh, the, the entire team's assets in form of obligations, gains, weaknesses, strengths, talents, and agreements are all blended and embraced as one. So it, it goes into much detail, of course, but it says in another part of the books, you only have one lifetime. You just live it in many different bodies and in different dimensions, but it's one life. And, and to the human mind needs this, you know, one of that life and this life and that life and that person has this life. We need that as individuals or we, we don't, we, we, we perceive it that way, but it's so vast, it's so collective and everything we do combines with these vibrational spheres that are described all through the books. And we contribute to these big spheres of love and healing and divinity and, and kindness and anger and all the other things we contribute and we draw from them. And so anything we put into them, others have access to. So what Lisa's saying is her mother has access to all the wisdom and healing and forgiveness and uh, effort that you know you made Lisa to heal from your own wounds, and sh she has complete access to 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 take to take that as hers and heal herself. And we're we're doing it for each other, and it's being done for us yes. over and over and everywhere. It's just so, so much bigger than the personal. And the team, even in book four, it's called Beyond the Team because it says, don't make this team idea a dogma and don't even limit it to a team because teams are combined with other teams and into leagues and legions and infinite oneness. And you yeah, know, ultimately. we can't comprehend that it really is one, but for yeah, our own yeah, mind, we're yeah. organizing it into right. teams. Yeah, yeah. From but where we are right now. It's all one. Yeah. As as the as Neil channeled through the conversation with God books, there's only one of us in the room. There's only one of us. I'm Isn't God, that a beautiful God, statement? Is in the room, yeah. And I think what's his name? Tabash um Blair, what's his name? Channel in New Zealand says. He's just God doing it his way, or she's just God doing it her way. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, I know it's so vast and expansive. And I love these books. When I first, when you when I first found them with you, as I said, I don't know how many years ago, probably about eight years ago, is it? I can't remember. Yeah, I'd have to look at our first interview, but I, I think it was three or three or four years in, maybe after, after I'd written them, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I felt like having read many spiritual books over the years that this was the next step. These books were the next step in spiritual evolution on planet Earth. You know, yeah. many of the books talk to us about our spiritual nature, but I felt like this these were the next step, like this took us much further into concepts that our linear human mind finds hard to understand. And um yeah, I remember, I think it was Penny Kelly saying when she inserted herself into the earth experience, she did so through all time and space. And I spoke to my my mob about that, uh, my guides about that, and they expanded on that, just saying exactly what you said. Like we think of, you know, when we come to the understanding of reincarnation, that we live a life, we die, we plan another life, we come back. We think of it as a linear experience, one after the other. Yeah. But they have That's said what that, we're used to. Like you just said, it's one life but lived through many lifetimes. We insert ourselves into the earth experience with a plan and we say, I'm going to come in this timeline and this timeline, I'm going to a woman and a man and I'm poor and rich, and we do it all at once. It's kind of like we look at the earth experience and we you know, plan it all in one go. It's not like live, die, make a decision, come back, die. You know, it's not this linear experience. Yeah. 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 Which is a bit mind-boggling for many people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And it's it, we need our minds to be boggled because right. <laughs> always staying in that same predictable route and even we we take these incredibly vast concepts and we take God and we make God in our image instead of realizing the soul is in the image and likeness of God. Right. We try to think, well, because I'm this, uh, as a human, human beings are this way, well, God must be this way. You right. know, not really, we just flip it all, flip it all around. Yeah. Um, yes, in the, in book one, it's mentioned over and over. And I want to bring it up because it's in the, the novel that I've written is that we have multiple aspects to our soul, just like we have multiple aspects to our brain. Part of our brain is for language, part for movement, part for memory, part for, you know, we know one part of the brain can be injured in a stroke and the rest of it still function. So we have these aspects to our soul, different parts. And the part or the aspect of the soul that comes, if you want to call it coming to the earth, is connected to this human body right now, is the part that wants that experience, uh, you know, being Francis, living the life of Francis, having the Francis experience. And the other aspects of my soul and your soul are off doing all kinds of other things. And that includes other lifetimes or other kinds of physical experiences, maybe not even on this planet, but if they are on this planet, in different timelines or right now simultaneous with us, but across the planet here on earth, you, you might wake up with a scientific invention. All of a sudden you've got it, Eureka. And it, there may be an aspect of you on the other side of the world that's been working on that same thing. And then you have all these, all this knowledge that comes together. Those may be aspects of the same being. It sounds like it's you know John and Juan and Tom and Suzanne and <laughs> Leela. All these different people contributed, and yet it could be the very same person and different aspects of them are on the planet at the same time. We're all over the place. Mm. So, yes, physical. Yes, we're in other timelines too of, of history, physical and spiritual aspects. Because, you know, when I had Michael Tamora on the show years ago, I recognized that he's also a spirit who's guiding and teaching in spirit as well as being in his physical body. So we are here and there simultaneously, like multidimensional in aspects on in physical worlds, as you say, some on other planets, yes. but also in, in spiritual domains and different levels of the different dimensions of the spiritual domain. Yeah. Yes. We don't always mm. come into, uh, uh, and we do not always come into a a physical form anywhere right, and many right. and we talk about our higher self our higher self are the aspects of our own selves that are not in the physical right exactly. and have that big broad view and that we yeah. can tune in into but lisa um, i know that you've got to go haven't you you've, you've got to go so do you want to share with people uh some of where because you said that you're coming down under next year in about a year <laughs> But do you want to share with people what you're up to musically? Because I know that you've probably got things going on. Well, I've been taking a bit of a break um, to just sort of realign myself. I unplugged from performing, social media and everything. This is the first interview that I've done in almost a year. And um, it's wonderful to come back to doing interviews talking about this, you know. Yeah. Happy to be here. And um, next year this time, I'm supposed to be in... Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne, and looking at, I'm going to be performing with the Sydney All-Star Big Band, and it's going to be a tribute to my mother. It's a wonderful big band show that I've done for a number of years, and it brings me joy, and it's just a joyful concert. You know, when people think of Nina Simone, I have to wonder if they think of the word joy, you know? So I'm interested because when I give honor to my mother. We were able to tap into that particular emotion and feeling. And so we're gonna be at the Sydney uh, State Theater on Thursday, the 26th of October, 2023. And uh, on the 20, what is it, the 24th, I'm gonna be performing right now, we're still in talks, but my hope is to be performing with Jeff Atkinson. Are you familiar with him? 
I've heard the name, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, Jeff Atkinson. He's a brilliant guitarist who plays all kinds of music. He has his own band, and we met through a person that knows him from Tryon, which is my mother's hometown, which is very interesting. And somebody gave him some Nina Simone ashes. And so oh. his wife contacted <laughs> me to say, oh. uh, you know that, you know, we have some of her ashes and we thought that this this should be yours. So we're going to come to one of your concerts. And then all of a sudden we all became friends. So <laughs> I'm excited yeah. to um, to hopefully be able to perform with his band as well. So those are the two dates right now that um, are taking place right there where you are. And then in uh, Brisbane, we're going to be at the, O is it the QPAC? The QPAC Concert Hall on Saturday, the 21st. And in Melbourne, we're going to be at the Arts Center Melbourne Hammer Hall on Saturday, the 28th of October. My website is lisasimonemusic.com. So anybody wants to just know a little bit more about me, my music, uh, see some clips, some live clips, interviews and background and pictures. It's, uh, it's a wonderful site to go to that's pretty comprehensive. And um, come out and join us for a wonderful tribute to Nina, Nina Simone and a celebration and get to know how the legacy is living yeah. when it comes to the stage and music right now. Are you, doing, today. are you doing any concerts in the States? Because to tell you the truth, my largest audience is an American audience. And my next largest after American is <coughs> French. I've got a very yeah. large French audience. Right, France is right. France. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it just so happens that I've just, I, when I moved here in January, I've been in France for the last eight years. So that's where I'm based. When I when I recorded my chapters of the team, I was in the French house in Southern France, yeah. in a closet. <laughs> that was my mother's house, which is now mine, in a little town called Carry the Way, just uh, a few kilometers out of Marseille. So France is my other home. And right now, when it comes to performing, I'm much more comfortable doing so outside of the country of my birth. Uh, Interesting. Um, Yeah, I come here. It's nice to come to America and not need anything from America. I find that the experience here is uh, um, not quite as positive when it comes to positive music and uplifting music, um, even though the masses need it and want it. Those people who are in charge of getting it to the masses, it can be a bit difficult, especially when you're not taking your clothes off and you're wow. not in your 20s as being wow. a female. So yeah. rather than pushing against that, I prefer to go to Europe and to come to um, the South Pacific and and Asia. And, you know, when I come to America, everyone will know. But right now, France is my other home. That's where I perform a lot of times and record a lot of times. So have you got some concerts coming up in France? Well, um, right now we're working on the big band concept right now. I, I blew everybody's mind when I pulled the plug and said, I'm walking away from the stage. So basically yeah. the Australian concerts are, are like your next, the, the next, you know, yeah, that, you coming back out onto the stage in Australia. I'm, Woohoo! Yes. Yeah. I, I, November of 2021 is when I had my last concert and I made my announcement uh-huh. for the Paris stage and other French stages, much mm-hmm. to everybody's surprise. I told them how much I love them and that it was just a pause and that I would be back. I had yeah. some inner work to do. I had some yeah. things to shed. Absolutely. I some preparing sure. to do within my own heart and soul and spirit to make myself ready to come back onto the stage in a new way. Yeah. And uh, with a new energy, it's almost like being reborn, if you mm-hmm. will. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because I had other plans actually when I came here. The, the North Star beacon that brought me here uh, didn't work out when I got here. And, and it was surprising because. It only took about four weeks for me to realize that the whole reason why I came here wasn't meant to happen, but I was meant to be where I am so that I could transform and do the inner work that I was supposed to do. So right now on my wall, uh, one of my meditations, I got a message from my team that says, seek for nothing, yearn for nothing. It is well, simply Mm. be. So I've had to learn how to simply be. Resting is a skill. To learn how to rest, I don't. I didn't know what that really yeah. was, and and how to just, you know. Yes, I know how to meditate and to be 
still, if you will, when I'm on the cushion, but to learn what that means to embody that, to live that, to leave yourself open enough to be able to receive and to be uh, energized and to shed the the weight uh, of, of things that are no longer serving you and how you live day to day. If I'm going to be a beacon for others through my music and through the messages within my music, then I have to live it and walk it and be it so that just by, by virtue of me walking into a room, people can feel the difference and say, hey, what did you drink this morning? What, what, did you, what are you doing? <laughs> I love it. You know, yeah. I'm reading the team. <laughs> 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 so hopefully I'll get a chance to see you at one of the concerts. And oh yeah, wouldn't that be something? Oh, I would love to get there. I I would love to get back to Australia. You know what? Darling one, you'll you'll have to come on down. You can stay with me. We've talked about oh. this before. We you know we talked about you coming back to Australia and then COVID hit, so it's like been. I know, I know. I you was know, there in know? 2014, so it would be like yeah, nine years. It doesn't seem possible that it's been that long. Yeah, yeah. Everything yeah. is possible. And I have the vision. Yeah. I'm holding the vision high that we'll okay. be able to be there together, Francis. Absolutely. Okay. And you and I will go to the concert holding together it. in Sydney. Oh, all right. Now we really got, yeah, I can feel that. Got yeah. chills. Didn't we get chills? Got that. Okay. You got, we got a year to plan. It's a year away. Like just right. a year away. We've got a year to plan it. That sounds, right. like a, that sounds like a great plan. <laughs> it does sound like a great plan. In fact, it feels like it's, I feel I feel so easy. It's just going to manifest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for Feels this. very meant. Oh, how beautiful! <laughs> Thank oh, you for coming, Lisa. Lisa, so gorgeous to meet you and to hear your experiences and and that you're part of the team now. Not that not not that anybody else is not part of the team, but yeah, <laughs> part of the team. Books. Thank you so much for coming Thank on the you. show and sharing with us today. And well, I look forward to your concert next year. Uh, me too. Me too. Be well. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Big love. <laughs> Ciao. How beautiful to meet Lisa. Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing. Yes. It's gorgeous. It's just been wonderful. Now, Francis, there's lots to talk about. I could talk about the team books all day, but we want to get to the new books as well. But you, you wanted to say something about, do you see my pink crystal yes. ball in the background there? It just wants to be known. It keeps popping through. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Yeah, it sure does. Really? Yeah. <laughs> The team books, uh, the audio book has two uh, recordings of my mother's voice speaking that, you know, are is a completely different experience for a person to actually hear her. And I open book one with something that was not written in the original book one. And by the way, in the month of October, you could get book one half price so that you have the edited version that mo more closely matches the uh, narrated version because it it needed a lot of you know, editing, revising and improvements. So there is a second edition basically of book one now out there. But the beginning of the vocal uh, of the narration has my mother speaking. And the the way this recording came to me, I explain in the in the audiobook, but I want to tell you now. It's very important. I had been writing these books for several years and a friend of mine sent me on through email some files. She said, I found in my computer these files under your mother's name. And uh, I remembered we had gone to Gina, my friend Gina's recording studio at her home, a home studio. And my mother had played the piano because she had all these fantastic old 1940s style songs that she would play and sing. And she was getting elderly and we wanted to preserve them. So she played Gina's piano. Gina recorded her. We all went home. That's all we remembered about that day. So she sends me this file. And of course, I listened to the music. 30 minutes of, her, of this music was so lovely. But at the end of it, it's tagged on another file. And it's my mother's voice speaking. And what she said when I heard it, I, I absolute chills went all over my body. I just froze because, now mind you, I've written two or three of the teen books and they're out in public. And this is what she says. And I want those who want to hear it 
to have the audiobook so you can hear it in her voice. She says, I am speaking to you as a member of a team, a team that believes the human race is preparing for a tremendous change, a change too beautiful to imagine or too frightening to consider. So she said those words and they were tagged on at the end of her music. So of course I contact Gina. I said, where did that file come from? She says, I have no idea. I said, listen to it. She said, well, she didn't say it at the end of her piano. Nobody ever had knew, had any concept of where that file came from. And I'm not even going to suppose where that wow. file came from because it's actually inconceivable to me yeah. that it exists and that it came into my hands after I had written the team books. That's I am speaking to you as a member of a team. Of a team. So that came from the other side. It yeah. came from the other side. And, yeah. and you know, it, it's something you just can't say to people. Well, this file materialized of my mother's voice. Yeah. Yeah. But well, we you don't can't have say it. Any, we have it. I can say it on this channel. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and it sounds almost like she's speaking in a formal way, almost like she's reading something. Mm -hmm. It's a message. It's a presentation. Wow. So. That's magic. And I can actually send it to you if you want to play it over this. Uh, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd love you to. Yeah, I can that, add that to you. That's magic. So, I'm speaking to you as the member of a team, a team that believes that the human race is preparing for a tremendous change, a change that may come in a form too beautiful to describe or too frightening to consider. Clearly, the, her team, the team, I call them the team, is eager for this material to get out, for this message to get out. Absolutely. And like we all know, the world is going through incredible changes mm -hmm. and we really do collectively have choices to make. Mm -hmm. What did she say? More beautiful than you can imagine. More, more beautiful than the human race is about to go through is preparing for a tremendous change, a change that is too beautiful to imagine mm -hmm. or too frightening to consider. Wow. We are, we have free will. You know, mm -hmm. we have free will. We have collective free will. Mm -hmm. um, and she really, yeah. these, these books, they focus over and over and over on not judging, on forgiveness, on perceiving the perception, perceiving the conditions of the world from the lookout tower of the soul instead of this narrow, oh, they're terrible and he's wrong and she's bad. And that, that is doing a lot of damage, that kind of thinking and that kind of perceiving of, of world events and individuals on this planet is doing damage. The team books are my priority, but yes, I will speak about these other these other two books that I have created. One is a novel that I wrote mostly through COVID called The Train to Hoffhausen. And it's the first novel I've ever written. It tells the story of two women, uh, one in 1939 in the middle of World War II and one in more modern times. And because we're talking about spiritual uh, matters, I'll just give away the meat of the subject, which I wouldn't normally do if I was telling the story, but the parallel of these two women's lives who seem to be completely different in completely different times of history and aren't physically meeting uh, are affecting one another because of the fact that the soul has many multiple aspects and one aspect is affecting the other aspect and is communicating to the other aspect and trying to help her make other decisions because as one aspect of us matures and grows spiritually, we are able to affect the, the less mature, perhaps, if you want to say, aspect of our being and make new decisions so that the, the old decisions and the effects of those old decisions and actions dissolve and a completely new reality appears as if the other never happened in the first place. 
So this is what the novel is about. It's called The Train to Hofhausen. Uh, I guess you'll put that out <laughs> so they can spell it. <laughs> and in New York City on November 18th, I'm having four actors are reading ep- excerpts of the book and we have some music. Uh, we have an event going on at the Whale Boom Shop, November 18th uh, at six o'clock in New York City to present. And there is a conversation between uh, a, a woman named Sister M.M., who is kind of the spiritual teacher in the story, and one of these women discussing this concept of spirit of aspects of the soul. So it's a very unique thing to be presenting in New York. And uh, it's my attempt to make a fiction, fictionalized version of a spiritual concept so more people can grasp it in a different form. The the other book that's coming out in about three months is called Verified. These, this is a collection of uh, supernatural and psychic and spiritual experiences that I and my family and close friends who are like family, have had in our lives. There are personal stories, and they're all verifiable in the sense that one person dreamed something, and then it it came to pass, and multiple people were aware of it. There were, these are all experiences that had proof. Uh, Some of them are hilarious. Some of them are unnerving and frightening. Some are just sacred and beautiful but they all have some kind of verification that makes, gives a person no doubt that they really occurred. So I'm real happy to put those stories out. Um, I think they'll be easy to read, easy to understand, and they're just so inspiring. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, you've shared a few of those stories with me over the years, those verifiable stories. I I can't remember all of them, but I do remember the one of you stopping at a stoplight and looking at a house and there was people on the veranda. Do you want to share that one? What was that one? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, in that particular story, I had three dreams in about two weeks uh, where I was being shown that I was going to die. They were very vivid. And because I have these kinds of dreams, prophetic dreams, I really knew what they meant. And in the dream, my, in one dream, my sister said, called my name. I looked back and she said, you paused. I said, yes. She said, well, you paused and you changed your destiny because every, the slightest pause changes what the timeline of what comes next. And then I had two more dreams of very vivid showing me the place this accident would occur and my former husband who has passed away meeting me there and saying I had died. So I knew that, that something was afoot. <laughs> but in all dream, all three dreams, I was saying, no, I don't want to go. I made a list of things I wanted to achieve. And the reason it was almost like I was reasoning with myself why I needed to stay. So uh, I went to my cousins one night. Um, it was December 21st, 2017. And yeah, that's about right. Anyway, on the way home, I told her all about it. And I said, I don't know, Lisa, you know, if I'm staying or going, but this is what I'm being shown. And on that, that night, as I drove home, I came through this residential neighborhood of very, there, these homes, uh, there'll be a picture of it in the book. These homes are very, are built back in the 1920s. They're, they're restored, beautiful, elegant homes that have been restored in this area. And one of them, many years ago was the location of a church, a metaphysical church that I and my mother belonged to. But for many years, it hasn't been a church. It's been a home. And whoever lives there, you never see anybody. Every time I've driven by there, it's like whoever's there, there, there's no sign of life. So I'm driving up past this church. I still think of it as my church. And as I approach it, and it's at 11 o'clock at night, streets dark, nobody around. The porch is all lit up with the big, big veranda, you know, big old fashioned veranda. It's all lit up. And and it drew my attention, you know, and then I see there's probably 15, 20 people on on the porch. Some are sitting on the the ledge and some are standing and some are sitting at a little table. And I thought, well, they're all 
elderly because their hair was glowing and I, they all have this beautiful white hair and I noticed their pretty hair. And I thought, wow, they're a, a party going on with these bunch of old people on this porch. It was so strange, you know, and I slowed down to just look at it because it, it bewildered me. And then I continued on. And in that very instant, it hit by a millimeter, this racing car that was speeding so fast just drew right in front of me. She would have driven right into my body. And it, I paused and it changed my destiny. But that wasn't all. My friends, when I told them about it, my friend Kathy, she said, well, that wasn't people on that porch. Those were angels. We're going back. We're going back. We're going to knock on that door. We're going to find out. So we ended up finding out from the people who live there, a very old man whose very sickly wife has to stay upstairs, can't even come downstairs without a uh, one of those chairlift things on the rail. He said, there was no party here. There's no people here. He said, well, we just, you know, my wife's sick. We just stay inside. Nobody... Nobody was ever here on my porch at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, <laughs> and it was very evident that these beings, my team, or perhaps those who have passed away in that church, because it was a long ago and many have died, manifested on that porch. Or perhaps gave me a hallucination of their manifestation. I don't know if anybody else could even see them but it caused me to pause and I did not have that accident. So many people were involved. And in fact, even the neighbor, we spoke to him first because we couldn't get the people to come to the door. And he was a, he's a neurosurgeon at the Mayo Clinic here in Jacksonville, very famous uh, clinic. And we told him all about it. And he said, you know, I tell the brain surgeons all the time about this stuff. He said, I believe it. Most of them don't, but he said, I do. Yeah. And yeah. He he said that nobody was over there. Nobody comes to that place. So yeah, that's all right, that a... was that story. So this that the book is full of of, of those kinds of, of things, that particular story and many others mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like them. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope it'll Beautiful. give people, you know. But the train to Hoff House and it, it went through a number of edits and it was all through COVID, you know, that and the audiobook. Uh was what I was working on. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, we all have something to offer. We have some ability, gift, presence. Uh, we have a sphere of influence. And, you know, mine is through writing and music. I'm producing, you know, spiritual music and, and my musical. And also there'll be a musical element to this presentation of the book. Mm -hmm. um, that's simply mine. And, what whatever it is each of us has even if it's just the way we speak to someone or the way uh lisa was talking about walking in a room and bringing a high vibration with you you know mm -hmm. it's the way we live our lives mm -hmm. that has the most impact yeah absolutely. i just want to encourage everyone you know to seek out whatever it is that they feel called to do to uplift this planet yeah and if it uplifts you as an individual is going to uplift others. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you do what you love, if you do what you're called to, if you do what brings you bliss. Right. Follow your bliss, follow your highest excitement. Um, I asked Lisa what her favorite chapter was in the book, and she said all of them, which I can understand. <laughs> They're all mine too. Yeah. But I, you know, I think that the I don't know if it's my favorite because as I read the books, as I read, they're all my favourite. But the one that just sticks in my mind is the one, and I don't know what, um, these are in the team books, it's the vibrational spheres, which we've gone into before. Yes. I think we talked about it in the Inner Sanctum. It, what book is that from? Book well, it's presented, the vibrational sphere chapter comes up in book two. In book two. Mm -hmm. But but then it's repeated in book three and maybe even in book four, because in the beginning of every book, I put two or three chapters from the previous book. Okay. Always um, to, yeah, book four doesn't have that going on, but books, it, the, the first chapter of book two is vibrational spheres. And yeah, yeah I think I love it. Me tremendously. This is the practical part of the book too because it helps us understand 
uh, probably more succinctly how thoughts work and attraction of thoughts work. You know, thought attracts thought. And yeah, yeah and there's a practical component. Yeah, how did it help you, the, the vibrational yeah. sleep? Well, you know, when I received that chapter, it explained to me, because I've told you before, before I had this experience, I would have terrible bouts of anger. Mm -hmm. That anger has left me. I was healed these 12 years of, of the burden of anger. Mm -hmm. But it, it made me understand that um, overwhelming emotions occur because we have tapped into a vibrational sphere where all the all the anger of the of of all beings is deposited. Because sometimes we've said and done things that we so terribly regret, and then you realize it was like a tidal wave. It was more than you, and you were really tapped into. And this is true for everything, whether it if you're struggling with addiction, it's not just your addiction. You are tuned into the addiction of others because you're tuned into the vibrational sphere of addiction. And if you're tuned into bliss, when you go into a state of bliss and, and say you're meditating, which many of us do in meditation, we are connecting with the bliss of all the universe, of all who have ever deposited meditational bliss. So these spheres, she says, are very real. She said, if we had the eyes to see them, we'd just see them floating everywhere. They're massive. And, and, you know, ultimately, we want to, to connect with the vibrational spheres of peace and love and faith and kindness. And the more we do that, the more we neutralize um, our connection to anything, anything else. But it helped me be more forgiving with myself for, for the times that I did, couldn't comprehend why I had been overwhelmed by a particular emotion. And I, I think it can help other people, too you know, to understand when we say you're not alone, you know, that works in all directions. We're, we're not alone in our anger either, or our, our depression or our addiction. Um, but if there's many exercises in the books of redirecting your focus to these incredible spheres of, of healing and love and peace and joy. Um, yeah, and, un unplugging. And and you can you can unplug from a sphere, and when you shift, unplug. and you shift your vibration, plug into another one. Yeah, yes. just like because it gives us a visualization too, which kind of helps um, to think that you know you're sort of being fed this this yeah. energy, and that you're feeding it, and it's feeding you. Yeah, and you can just go nah, and unplug. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> you are always contributing something. Mm -hmm. We're always contributing. We can't stop. We're always contributing to these spheres. To the spheres. Because yeah. we're always creating. And we're always right. thinking. And we're, right. So yeah, just I get I I no longer contribute to that sphere. Right. I no longer want to receive. I I'm going in this direction. I'm going to contribute to another another sphere of yeah, and and contributing to the expansion of the sphere of joy and love and bliss and excitement and and prosperity and and abundance and um you know, invention and creativity, like we're contributing to all these areas of life when we place our focus there, instead of contributing to the, you know, the news is bombarding us with what's going wrong. And as we focus on it, we're contributing to that, right? What we focus on, we're contributing to. But I'd love to read it just a little bit from that chapter. Because that I, I don't the vibrational sphere. Yeah, I don't know if it's this is my favorite, but it's the one that lives with me on a day to day basis of all the things that I've read. This is your mother. I think your mother speaking from my perspective on the other side. I see a wonderful universal system at work, which I believe is one of the most important things that you can grasp. This concept will help you better understand why it is that humanity experiences such exaggerated extremes of well being and or negativity, both on a personal and collective levels. It will also help you comprehend the method through which the team members align themselves with one another. The impulses that originate from, a, from deep within one's being pass through many stages as they move from their launching point into full manifestation. First, they rise up as seemingly unbidden strings before you and are even aware of their own existence. 
before you are even aware of, oh, they rise up before you are even aware of their own existence. Next, they become formalized through thought. Once they enter the active thought stage, these impulses begin circulating through the bands of time and space that compromise the Earth's dimension. And when they whirl out into timelessness and spacelessness, where they duplicate, triplicate, and expand endless, endlessly into eternity. Whew. These expansions occur not because the thoughts by themselves grow, but because they are magnetically attracted to one another, the same kind. So like attracts like. So it's really speaking here about the law of attraction, working in the realm of thought, right, and thought manifests and creates manifest eventually becoming a part of an enormous sphere compromised uh, comprised of those specific types of vibrations as a result there exists all throughout the universe countless spheres of these thoughts collections and each of us is connected to them through our unique vibrational alignment yes <laughs> And the good thing is we can change our alignment. Right. And we can tune into the higher spheres. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And we can forgive ourselves and others for some of the overpowering and disturbing things that we have done or that we hear about other people doing. Right. She speaks so much about not judging. In book one, the hodgepodge that is the earth, that chapter, mm -hmm. she talks, uh, she says, we are all painting over our own graffiti. I love that because she said, when you, when you look at all the, um, I want to read this one little part because I was told to mark it. Um, when you look at all the things that people do in the, the world to try to make the world a better place. She said to remember many of the most passionate workers upon the earth in the fields of human rights, animal rights, ecology, spirituality, healing, counseling, and the like are those very ones who are determined to change the vibratory conditions of the negative situations they were participants in before. She, she says that um, we can become prideful even about our good works and think that we're something special and that others who aren't doing those good works are less than. And she points out that usually when we feel very strong, she said, for example, if you are holding placards for peace with great passion, you most likely are doing so because you signed on the dotted line for war at one time in your, in your history of aspects, having all these experiences. So everyone is sort of like either, we can see everyone around us as either, as a form of us. They're either our future self, our present self, or our past self. And we can see someone who's doing something really repulsive to us and understand that we have had that experience or a teammate has and we are who we are now but we have this aspect that we are now has not always been at this point of awareness so compassion and not judging when i revisited team book one in, in the narration that's what uh, jumped out at me and i thought oh my gosh i'm i'm hearing it from a different level at, at 12 years later, um, it really is the theme. And understanding that clay that, that you, you sh I think it was Lisa that mentioned the clay, that you, you shape this clay and you can put markings on it and see past, present, and future. But when you roll it all up in a ball like putty, it's all in the now. You know, it's all one. And so everyone we ever were or will be, you know, is in that balled up in that now and it, to have compassion for ourselves and forgiveness for ourselves and everybody else it's the key to everything 
according to the team books. According to the team books, (laughs) according to source. It's the key to everything. Absolutely. You know, I, my friend that I said that had died had, um, had has been giving me great lessons from the other side when it looked like only a couple of months ago that he was the one that was in need of help because of his suffering and because of his stance on don't you talk to me about your spirit guides I don't believe in all that crap I don't believe in life after death and he was terrified of dying so from my perspective my human perspective I saw him as suffering and in need of help but when he communicated with me from his perch on the in a higher dimension he said, um, when I asked him about, you know, him judging me for believing in spirit guides and afterlife, and here he is talking to me from the other side, he said to me, wasn't I a great character? <laughs> <laughs> and then he said to me, you know, one of my highest goals or highest desires was to bring people together. I loved bringing people together. And in fact, I wish I had done it more, but he did it through his music and when he launched his album, he brought people together and he was so excited about that, although he was stressed out by all the details of what that entailed, oh, yeah. you know, like, but he said, my demise actually did that, Would brought so many people together, it brought his girlfriend's sister, who was a, a palliative care nurse, came from another state to look after him and family came and friends came and actually his suffering brought people together so there was this higher perfect purpose to his suffering and in so many ways he didn't want me as the healer to come and alleviate his suffering because his suffering had a purpose had a purpose right and and so yeah that judgment Mm. that you you know you talk about this judgment that we had so I was in judgment that I wanted to help alleviate his suffering because as a healer that's what you want to do sometimes we have to step back and say how is this serving us you know, how is this serving the collective? Um, he couldn't see that perspective, I have to say, from his human experience because he was in suffering. But he was very peaceful towards the end because uh, he was in a lot of pain and they were, you know, lots of drugs. But from his yeah. perspective on the other side, yeah, the beauty of it all and um, the beauty of it all. Yeah. And his funeral, because he was Jewish, you know, went for a week. Yeah. And that brought people together from all over Australia and all over the world, actually. Yeah. And, you know, so his death was all part of his desire to bring people together and bring them together from different faiths and religions and eclectics, you know, social standings, the hippies and the snob ones and the Jewish people and the Hindus and the Christians. And, you know, they all came together like this. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it's amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah. We have to look at life from this broader perspective and not judge. Look out, tower good. of the soul. Right. Look out, tower of the look soul. Look out, tower of the soul. Not judge good or bad, right or wrong, no. because often what is wrong, just like um, just like uh, you said th- that they said you're going through a change. Teddy says that we're going through a change more beautiful and more terrible, like the terrible is all part of the beautiful and the beautiful is all part of the terrible. Yeah, It's all one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> roll it up in a ball it's all one yeah mm-hmm. but we we really might we really do have you know this tremendous free will and this ability to choose and I did want to to mention one thing because I know we probably need to wind this up uh, in book four <laughs> we are okay I'm going to read a little bit from the chapter called identity Know ye not that ye are gods? You know, this is a a, a quote from the Bible. Why do so many people hear those words but simply cannot feel their own beauty, their own goodness, their own power as something real? You are made in the image and likeness of God. Why do so many feel these words apply to others but not to them? You are the light of the world. Why do so many struggle with self-loathing even after they have studied the nature of their own soul? The answer to this is actually quite simple. It has two parts. Number one, it is not enough to be made in the image and likeness of God. You must choose to act from your divine identity. If you do not choose it, you will not feel it to be true. I think what you're saying is just that. Number two, 
you did not create, create your own divine nature. You were created by a pair of spiritual parents who were also created by divine beings, who were also created by divine beings, on upward to the one. And she points out some, some people, they feel humble and they say, no, I, I, I'm too bad of a person. I can't possibly claim, say that I'm, uh, know ye not you are gods and you have the light within you or any of that. I can't accept that because I'm just too awful. And she's pointing out, you didn't, you can say it because you didn't create yourself. You were created by divinity. So it isn't a prideful thing at all to say any more than it is to say, my parents created me and I have their brown eyes. It's simply a fact that you are a divine being, that you were created by divine beings. It's not prideful or humble or anything to acknowledge it. And yet you will not feel it to be true unless you choose in a certain situation to act from it. And the world is in this big transformational point. And what is being, we're being called to do is to act from it. And in those times when we're just going along and we're thinking, well, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? Huh? To, to tune into it and say, you know, some people like that saying, what would Jesus do? Well, what would, what would my divinity do? I feel this way, I feel negative, I feel tired, I feel indifferent, I feel judgmental. Okay, snap yourself out of it. What does my divine nature say that I am to do? We have to choose it. We have to choose it over and over and over and over, or we won't feel it. I just felt like I was led to read that. Absolutely. <laughs> and it we feels have, connected to what she had to say. Yeah. Yeah, we have to keep choosing it absolutely over and over again. We have to. It's not like you choose it once and then you're set. It's yeah. like in the next moment you'll have to choose it again, and the next moment yeah. you'll have to choose it again. Yeah, because we're given this ultimate choice in everything. You know, do I yeah. do I suffer or do I do I soar? And in each moment we've got that choice. Yeah, no matter what's happening, right? No matter what's happening. Yeah. The team books say the choice of the moment. In every moment, there is the highest choice. Mm -hmm. Now, it's different in every moment. Mm -hmm. It may be whatever it is, choose the highest of what is available. That's mm -hmm. all you can do and all we're asked to do. Mm -hmm. And it might not even look like we have that great of a situation to choose from. But in every situation, there is a choice. It doesn't mean you're going to reach all the way up in every moment. You can't, you, you can't reach the stars but you can go one incremental step above and and reach for the highest that is available in that moment yeah yeah absolutely and that's connected to how you feel i think the more peace that you feel in that choice the the higher the choice yeah, yeah. the more angst connected to the choice the yeah. lower the choice the more the more peace yes and, and joy and you know alignment with bliss the higher but the it's choice. all relative so even if it is kind of a lower choice. It might have been the best in that moment that you yeah. could do. Mm -hmm. It might be that you didn't punch somebody in the nose and you chose to walk away. That might have been the best in yeah. the moment. You're still yeah. angry, but you walked away. <laughs> you know what I'm trying I'm, to say? I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, like when I was experiencing uh, my friend, because um, I really wanted to help alleviate his suffering. And so I was frustrated. So do I stay in the frustration when he's saying no? Or do I just let go and just let the perfection unfold? You know, like, because to the to the healer in me, I want to, like, help alleviate his suffering, which seems yeah. like a high choice, right? But that was connected to angst because he was saying, no, right? Uh -huh. No, don't alleviate my suffering. Don't help me. I don't want your help. Uh -huh. So letting go of trying to help somebody which doesn't feel like the right thing to do as a healer was actually the more peaceful choice because it just like accepting yeah. and letting go felt better than like no I want to so yeah mm -hmm. sometimes in those situations it's simply remembering that we're not the only one they have right. a team that's right and they right. have they have and we want to do all of it but um if, if we're not allowed to do it if we're literally told no um we can radiate, you know, our thought and our energy right. is very powerful. We can do that from our side 
and, and let it go and know that their team is with them. I've had to do that in so many situations. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Apply this. Family, I've friends, written this down. Whatever. Apply this me- message. This is something I've written down from the team books, which speaks about what you're talking about. Apply this message to any situation you're going through where you know there might be tension. Send out a vision of harmony, acceptance, and goodwill ahead of yourself in order to activate the possibility. The alternative that exist yeah become a conscious creator creator to open doors to positive potential bring that vision out of the chambers of the soul and into the fray of the day (laughs) i love the way you've written this because that's you that's your words that you're choosing even though it's channeled information you're still choosing the the words well they were very specific about those words i can (laughs) tell you that (laughs) it can it can do you no good buried in the realms of wish of uh, wistfulness wishfulness you are there to make it so yeah so when you're going into when you know there's going to be tension like instead of thinking about oh this is going to be bad this is going to be terrible this is going yeah you're like think of the alternative I remember a girlfriend of mine said to me years ago that she was going to break up with her husband and how that was going to devastate him and the kids are going to be upset and she's like projecting the horror of it but the decision was hers to make, right? This is this is the right decision for me. And I said to her in that moment, well, that's a long time ago now, I said, is that what you want to create? Like maybe he'll be sad for a little bit, but he'll get over it quickly and he'll yeah. find a new love and the tension between the two of you will be alleviated by the separation uh-huh. and the children will be happier and like create the scenario you want instead of right. like how devastating it's going to be. And she looked right. at me because she's a healer as well and she goes, Oh yeah, thanks for the reminder. Oh you know, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. It's like there's I another forgot. way. There's another well, way. Well, what what you just read from was called activating the uh, uh, activating the alternative in right. book one. Book one, and it is in the narrated version. I, uh, yeah, I think my sister narrated that chapter. Activating the alternative. Oh, how beautiful! Yes, indeed. Um, Oh well, Our darling. I suppose visualizations oh, have a lot, a lot to do with what we project out there. Our visualizations, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Francis, it's been so beautiful to catch up with you again and to likewise you know, open the delightful knowledge of the team books again to the public. And what a joy to meet Lisa. So Francis says to me, she's emailing me yesterday or <laughs> texting me or saying. You know, can I bring someone on that is did the narration and she's a real fan of the team books? And I said, Oh yeah, what does she want to talk about? You know, like how it's affected her. I said, Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And then, <laughs> and then just before, just before we turn, I turn on the recording, she goes, Oh yeah, and my mother Nina Simone. And I look at her and I said, Your mother was Nina Simone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did send you the website and I, I I know you and I thought, well, she'll be looking for sure at that website. Um <laughs> I didn't and, and look figure at out who because is, yeah. honestly, honestly um, Lisa, on her completely so cele- c- completely separate from her celebrity stas- status, is just a beautiful, spiritual, wise being, and that's Absolutely. really why I wanted her to come on this show. Right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's how I knew her for a while before I even realized that she right. You that's know, who she is. Yeah, yeah. Who she does in the in in her physical life. I loved hearing her talk about taking a, a you know a hiatus and and just delving and because you know the whole celebrity music industry can be so seductive, yes. can it? And um, to just say stop and I need to go within and and yes. and then when you're like you know that light is shining within you, then that you take that light out to the broader public, and you know it just makes my heart absolutely sing when I see people that are you know celebrities that are shining this sort of light into the world that they're that this sort of message is is being brought out into the more wider audience through somebody like Lisa and and even Nina she's very intentional Mm -hmm. very intentional and her mom coming through her very intentional about what she's doing with her gifts exactly she wants them to be used yeah Um, yeah just makes wonderful yeah it's beautiful 
But Francis, it's been so beautiful catching up with you. Thank you again you. for coming on today and sharing Thank you, sharing you Thank and you. your new books and the team books. Well, I'll send you I'll, I'll send you a text with all the the proper uh, websites and spelling and so forth if you if you want to put it up later or whatever because I know it's tricky the train to Hofhausen and I'm going why did I why did I name it that nobody can even find the book because I can't spell it they look on Amazon they can't figure out what it's called why did you name it that where does the name Hofhausen come from it means house of hope in German okay and um I just I that's the name that's that came name. to me that's mm-hmm. the name that's the House place there you go who knows why thank you again <laughs> big love to thank you thank you it was really an honor bye-bye how beautiful to catch up with Francis again today I can't speak highly enough about the books I think you got that from you know <laughs> the conversation that we had that yeah mandatory reading for anyone on a spiritual Uh, spiritually awakening on a spiritual path spiritual journey absolutely mandatory reading just love those books i'm going to reread them again in fact after this conversation because i've read all of them cover to cover but you don't read these books once these sorts of books and just like francis said 12 years after writing the first book and having read it several times rereading it again to do the audio recording you gain new insights, like more insights are revealed, ever expanding, ever dawning realizations of the symphony of the multidimensional aspects of life. Yeah, just beautiful. And she said that although that she attributes her mother to being the focus through which the books came, her, she is a part of a team. And she said when she was writing the books, that many voices came, many, many flavors and many voices. Some sounded more scientific and some sounded, you know, so it wasn't, even though she sort of perceived it as her mother, which was the container through which she had the initial contact on the other side, there were many voices and expertise coming through. So the team wrote the team books, like a big team wrote the team books. (laughs) Beautiful. And how gorgeous to meet Lisa. That was a surprise to me this morning, as I said on the show. (laughs) She's like, can I invite someone on that narrated the books? And uh, little did I know it would be Lisa Simone, um, Nina Simone's daughter. So there you go. That was a beautiful surprise. And I was saying, I was saying to Francis while we were off camera, ah, I, you know, I felt really like um, passionate about getting these books more widely known because the information in them is just so beautiful and poignant and um, bringing that celebrity, you know, name to the team books is a way that will get the message out there. Um, I said to her that my, my personality ego perspective was impatient for these books to be more widely known. But the team, the mob, would say, all in good time, they'll be out there when they need to be out there and, you know, all in good time, all in good time. I suppose humanity has to be ready for it. There needs to be an audience for this sort of information. Not everybody's ready for it. Uh, they're, they're exploring other aspects of spirituality. But as I said during the recording, during the show, that it, I felt like these books were the next step, the next step. Yeah. It does go over a lot of the other stuff that other people talk about, other books that are in other books, Course of Miracles and um, you know, Paul Selleck's channel books and the Conversation with God books and the Abraham material and the Seth material and the Bashar material. It goes over all that sort of stuff, um, but it kind of takes it even further, I think, personally, I think. So, so beautiful. I'm not going to yak too much. Uh, I've got, um, I was just saying to Francis, I've got a busy, I've got a busy year happening already i hadn't thought about booking people in for the show next year but talking to neil gord on email from portal to ascension he wants me to showcase some of the people he's got coming up in his conference the portal to ascension conference which is happening in april in now where is it in 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 somewhere in the states in um anyway i'll have to look it up but um he's uh he's just booked in a whole slew of you know people that are going to be speaking to come on the show so I'm set for the first few months of next year the shows are booked out I thought oh that's easy I don't even have to you know organize that someone's done it for me so that's beautiful so some amazing people coming on the show next year some who are very well known and some who are not so well known 
uh, there are, are people that um, I've been talking to for a while, you know, to get you on the show. Adam Apollo is one of them. Adam and I have said, yeah, I'll get you on the show, but we've just not organized it. I love him. He's amazing. Caroline Corey, Barbara Lamb, you know, these are big names in the spiritual community. I've never had them on the show. I felt like Barbara Lamb, um, you know, I've had Mary Rodwell on the show. She's the Australian version of Barbara Lamb, but Barbara is just beautiful. I've met her many times on Zoom calls with the uh, Galactic Alliance or the Wish Alliance. She's often on the Zoom calls that Sheila puts on. And um, so it's going to be delightful to meet her sort of more one-on-one and, and have a discussion with her and lots of gorgeous, wonderful star seeds and light workers. So yeah, that's the show booked for the first few months of the year. Done, done and dusted. And um, Sheila and I have got some other things in the pipeline for next year that uh, we'll be announcing soon. But I have to tell you all, the CAN Conscious Awakening Network is launching, well, now, 15th, the 15th of October. Conscious Awakening Network is Sheila's, Sheila Seppi from the Galactic Alliance and the Wish Alliance, or used to be called the Wish Alliance, has done a deal with some, I don't know, app developers to put conscious content onto streaming platforms. So none of the streaming platforms I can get in here in Australia. So streaming platforms like Roku, we can't get Roku in Australia, but it'll come because I think that it's getting quite big. And Amazon Fire, which is actually a stick, but it has its own content as well. Um, she said that we should be able to see it on Amazon Prime. I was looking at it yesterday. You can download the app, the Conscious Awakening Network app, but only on Android at this point. So the app will have all the shows. So my show, a couple of my shows, like I don't know, about six or seven of my shows will be on there and Neil's shows from Portal to Ascension and Alan Steinfeld shows. And, and she's got quite a few people. So she's putting this conscious content onto um, streaming for Apple as well, Apple streaming. And um, the sky's the limit, right? So it's just, I mean, it's all out there on YouTube. All our shows are out there on YouTube for people to find. This is just another way that people can find this sort of conversation on their streaming platforms. Yeah. And that's exciting. Isn't that exciting? That's very exciting. So that's launching like now, right now. So if you go to the Conscious Awakening Network, I'm not sure if she's actually launched the website yet, but if you go to the Conscious Awakening Network, can um, she's already up on Facebook and Instagram and I think Twitter, you know, she's got all the platforms happening and check it out and, and check it out. Um, as I said to Sheila, I was chatting to Sheila, Sheila yesterday, yesterday or the day before at a meeting. At this point, I can't access any of it from Australia, but that'll change. It's only new. Um, things will evolve and, and change. I bet you the cat's wanting to get in, meowing at the door. Deb's Shakti is coming up in the Inner Sanctum at the end of October. My Sunday morning, I think the 30th, your Saturday evening, afternoon. Oh, it's 11, 11 here you know, in Sydney, um, in, the, in the US and Canada and um, Europe. I think it's 11 a.m. p.m. Clocks are changing. All the clocks are changing. So, um yeah, our clocks have gone forward. Your clocks are going to go back in the US and that sort of makes a big difference in the times. But check out Time Buddy. You can see all the times there. But Debs is the hypnotherapist from the movie Alien Abduction Answers by John Yost, who shares his story about his alien abduction and, and, and what he found out by going to a hypnotherapist. And Debs was the hip hypnotherapist. She's been on the show. Check out my show I did with her. And she has a group of teachers, her mob, she calls the teachers or the star teachers that channel through her. So she's coming into the Inner Sanctum as our guest teacher this month. And Rob Schwartz cancelled next month. We had Rob next month, but he cancelled. I might get him on next year. So I'm uh, looking at somebody else to fill November. I've got someone in mind. We just have to figure out schedules. So that's exciting. She's another galactic, you know, multidimensional wonderful teacher she's wonderful so come and join us in the inner sanctum and i'm on uh, once a month i think next month i'm a part of a conference called the ultimate star being conference so it won't be the first of the month me in the inner sanctum it'll be the next week but the ultimate star being conference is running at the beginning of november five day free conference for you all and i'm one of the speakers amazing speakers i think there's about 50 speakers so that's, this will exhaust you if you watch all this. Hmm. Cat's doing strange things. Anyway, I'm going to go 
love you all thanks for listening and watching and sharing the shows i was just saying to francis the audio platform my downloads have exploded i think i've had over half a million downloads this year on the audio platforms it's just taken off youtube not so much but the audio platforms sure so thank you everyone that's listening on audio for your participation in these in these conversations it's a blessing i think i'm getting like 30 40,000 downloads a day it's really cool very cool um but yeah and i'm now on rumble and bitchute trying to find an audience there bitchute so rumble bitchute and odyssey as well as this platform as well i shouldn't say this platform because you might not be listening but as well as youtube but remember to check out the book awakened by death if you haven't already and i'll catch you next time bye for now Thank you.